Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for being uh, to, to understand the situation last week that they couldn't come. I was sick. Um, Lucky I am better now. And you spend that week with the TA that review the chapter four about numerical integration techniques. But before that week, we were working on nonlinear system, and we have a last problem. And that last, last problem, we were trying to get the face portrait um, for, for, that, uh, for that system. So we will review that very quickly. So the system we were studying was this uh, system with two state variables, and I have the summary there in the in the whiteboard. So we have two variables x1 and x2. That's those are the nonlinear function, and we obtain the equilibrium point. In which case, in this case, we have three equilibrium points, and then we linearize the system around a particular equilibrium point. And that's the linearization. Now, when we replace the value for x2 uh, at the equilibrium point, we have three, then the linearized representation will change. Basically, the matrix system will change if we evaluate this either at the point one, two, or three. So when we evaluate this at the point one, the equilibrium point is the origin, then the matrix A of the linearized system becomes this matrix A. We can calculate the IM values, but here by inspection of the matrix immediately, we realize that the IM values for this case are plus minus J. So this is a center. Um, we can calculate IM vectors here, but that will not give us information about how we can uh, plot these in the phase plane. Yeah. So for all that we can say at this point is that the equilibrium point at the origin is going to be a center. So what is a center? Is a linear system that will oscillate forever. But this is not a linear system. But what we're saying that very close to the origin, the system would behave as this is a center. So uh, if, if, if you have uh, this in the, in the phase plane, then you will have a trajectory that is like this. And we need to determine what is the direction of the oscillation in this case. And because you have two variables, x1 or x2, is this oscillating uh, clockwise or number clockwise? What would you say? And the initial condition? Uh, you, you, we're trying to get the phase for trade, so it doesn't matter the initial condition. We want, just want to have a description of how we're, the solution are going to be starting from different points. So, but if, if we're very close to the region, what we're going, going to observe is a periodic trajectory. Uh, it will be repeated over and over again. The question is, this is going to be clockwise or counterclockwise? How do we determine that? Well, we, we assume some situation, for example. What about if, and, and this is going to be x1 and x2, and what about if x2 is positive? What can you say? For some reason, we're in the trajectory when x2 is positive. What would you say? Well, you need to see how the variables change. So because we're very close to the origin, this term is going to be very small. Right? When you have x2 minus x2 cubed, this is roughly speaking x cubed, right? So if, if, if this is positive, what happens to the variable x1? Will increase, will increase. So anytime when we are here, when x2 is positive, x2 will increase and move to the right. So what should be the direction for this? Clockwise. And we can verify the same thing. What happened when x2 is, is, is negative? Well, x2 is negative, then x1 will decrease. So that's exactly what we're going to get. 
The same thing we can do for this part. Um, what about if X1 is uh, positive? We're in this, in the first or fourth quadrant. If X1 is positive, what happened to X2? This negative X1, so decrease. So exactly, that's, that the trajectory will go in that direction. And if X1 is uh, negative, then X2 will decrease. So by looking at the, at the state space representation, we can infer how the oscillation will behave. In this case, it's going to be a center, and we will have this periodic trajectory, and it's going to move uh, clockwise. Yeah. Now we repeat the same thing with the point two. Uh, with the point two, then we have this equilibrium point: x one is negative one, x two is one. We replace that here, and we obtain this map. So when we have a matrix, then we obtain the, the eigenvalues, um, and we have this quadratic equation. We solve it, and we got two eigenvalues. Those are real, but the square root of three is 1.73 and something else. So in one case, you will have a negative uh, eigenvalue, and the other is going to be positive. So what we have here is a subtle number. We did this last time before I, I, I got sick. Uh, and for one eigenvalue here, uh, lambda one, this is the positive eigenvalue. So this is going to be related with an exponential growth. For the positive eigenvalue, then we, we have the uh, singularity equation here. And because this is linearly dependent, we just pick one equation out of these two. We pick the second equation here, you have a plus this coefficient times b equals zero. So you can isolate for a in that equation and you have, you have this. So if we arbitrarily pick b equal to one, then a must be that value. Something similar for the other eigenvalue, and we have these uh, negative real eigenvalue. So this is the stable one. And we proceed in the same fashion. We get the singularity equation for that case, something like this, but with lambda two. So here's going to be negative square root of three, the same thing here. And we get the equation and we proceed in this very similar fashion. We will pick uh, the second component of the vector. Let's say that that's one. And we can determine the first component of that vector, which in this case is going to be that quantity. So I think that until this point, we, we were, before I got sick, we finished this part, we were trying to get the description, but uh, we couldn't uh, finalize. So now we're going to, I'm not going to spend more time in uh, practicing how we calculate eigenvalues and eigenvector. Uh, I, do you have any question about that? Are, are you okay with that? Calculating eigenvalues and eigenvector? Do you have any question? No? Is that fine? Yes? Uh, I think from the second homework, I was confused on how to draw a distinct phase portrait out of the two values. I was just wondering if you could just go over it real quick. I'm, I'm going to finish that and, and get the phase portrait for this case. Yes. Yeah, we will do that. And for the last equilibrium point, point three, then we repeat the same process. We get the matrix A, we get the eigenvalues, which are this one in this case. And again, here you will have a positive real eigenvalue and a negative real eigenvalue. This is unstable, this is stable. And we use a singularity equation to get the eigenvector for lambda one and eigenvector for lambda two. So those are all the values. And now we proceed with the description of the phase portrait. So here I'm going to have the X1 axis. And here we have the X2 axis. And we have three equilibrium points. One is at the origin. And then we will have, let's see, one, two, one, two, we 
have the second equilibrium point right there. And the third equilibrium point right there. So these are going to be centered, um, but we can work on that point. And for that point, uh, let, let me let me put again the, the values here for point, point two. We have lambda one and q one and lambda two and q two. So for that point, we have Yeah, so that's all the information we have. Let's start with this point two. For point two then, we have linearized the system. So now the variables here are going to be delta x1, delta x2 with respect to the equilibrium point. So if, uh, if we use the eigenvectors, uh, we need to draw these eigenvectors using as uh, the origin, the equilibrium point. So for the first one, Q1, these are going to be a straight line in the plane. So we can look at this coefficient and we can think in this way. If we move along the direction of delta x2 in one unit, whatever that unit is, then we will move along the x1 direction in the opposite direction, negative direction. And this is going to be 2.73, a little bit smaller than three times. So if you move in, in one quantity through x2, through x1, you will move in the negative direction 2.73 times. So if we do that, it, it, if this is going to be one unit, let me, this is about that, one, two, three, one, two, three. So this is one, we move in X2, the direction of two, we move one quantity along X1, we will move in the negative direction, 1.2, this is three, this is 2.73. Uh, so the point is going to be, because this is a straight line, it's going to be a line that pass through this point. Now, if X2 is moved in the same quantity, but in the negative direction, then we will be here. And for X1, we will move in the positive direction, 2.73, and the line will pass through that point. So let's see if I can draw this better this time. It's going to be, a straight line that pass through those points. So this vector right here is going to be x1. Is this a stable or unstable one? Is this positive or negative? So unstable. unstable. Therefore, from the equilibrium point, this, if you get close to this eigenvector, this will push you away from that equilibrium point. We do the same thing with the other one, but this is different. So in this case, if you move one in one quantity along X2, you will move about 0.73 along X1, right? So if this is one, if you move one along X2, you will move 0.73, let's say there. And here you will move there. And let me see if I can do this. It's going to be a line that pass through those points. So this one right here is going to be Q2. And this is negative. This is a, the stable one. 
And if you get close to those eigenvector, if you are very close to the equilibrium point, then you will be attracted to the equilibrium point. Yeah. So we have some description there that can help us. Something similar for the point three. So we can draw this one. This is then a stable one. And we proceed in the same fashion. So if you move in one direction, in, in one quantity along X2, you will move, uh, how much is that? It's negative 0.73 along X1. So if you move here, if this is one quantity, this is X2. So along X1, you will move a negative 0.73. Uh, so these will pass through that point. And the same thing will be on this side. And we can trace a line that passed through these three points. And this is going to be Q1 of the point three. Because this is the unstable one, if you get close to this, it will push you away from the equilibrium point. And the last one, which is a stable one, we proceed in the same fashion. If this is one, this will be displaced 2.73. So we have this. If this is one, two, and three, 2.73 might be somewhere here. There. And this is going to be one, two, three. And 2.73 must be somewhere there. So we trace a line between this, along these three points, and we get the second description. This is Q2 related to the stable ion body. This is the stable one, therefore, you get close to this trajectory and you will be attracted to the equilibrium point somehow. So are you getting some idea so far? I can, I can see if you move here, the system will push you up and somehow you might be trapped by this part of the system. And the last, the last equilibrium point is the origin and we determined that that was a center. So whenever we're close here, you will have trajectories here that are centered. Yeah. So if we put all of these together, you know, this is a linearization. If you start moving away from the equilibrium point, the, the linearization will not be that accurate, but at least will give us some idea of how the system should behave. Yeah. So I can by having this description already, I can anticipate that if we are somewhere inside this confined area, the system will be stable and will be trapped inside with permanent oscillation. Even though it has two saddle nodes. Even though the system has two polygons that are saddle nodes, the system might still be stable. That's called, we can call, we're not going to formally determine this, but this can be mathematically obtained some region of attraction, a region in which we prove and guarantee that if the system is staying that region, it will never leave and the system will be stable. Now, if you start from farther point, let's say on this side, the system was here, well, you might be attracted to that equilibrium point, but very soon you will be pushed to infinity. And the same thing in this area, this one to be a little bit interesting because you have two equilibrium points, but at, at the end, you will diverge to infinity. The same thing on this part, you will come from here and you will move to infinite and the same thing, this part right here. So by, by this description, we were not able to get the exact solution of the system, but we were able to get a nice description and anticipate how the system might be shaped. That's the idea of the phase perturbation. Yes? So 
So it's not about if you like proving that like a certain region, if you stay in a certain region, you know the, the, the system would never leave that region. Is it just about like looking at a particular point and then proving that given its trajectory, it will return to that point? Or and then just doing that for a whole area, or is there like some more rigor to that? Uh, typically, when we try to prove this kind of uh, region of stability, we use some concept of energy. So we, we if we show that the system when we are in this area, uh, it's impossible that can get get more energy and escape this region. Then we can uh, mathematically show that the system will never leave this part, and we can call it the region of attraction. And that's very intuitive. Yes. Yes. So you had a question about how to draw the phase progression. Does this clarify the issue you were having? Have further, further question? I'll just ask you after the class. Okay, okay, no problem. So this is just to find a lot. Okay, please. I have a question about the first point. So because the because it's a sensor, does it still have eigenvectors or no? We will have eigenvectors that are going to be complex, and that will not help us to draw anything in okay. the phase plane. So you don't need to. Um, that will have some implication in regards to the, 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 the delay or shifting of, of the input and output. We, the explanation we have for the eigenvectors are in the sense of a linear transformation. So if you have a vector x, ax will transform into something else, y. So we might have some interpretation about what is the shifting between x and y when they are complex. But for plotting these in the plane, that, that will provide no information. And so if you have complex uh, equilibrium points, what does that mean exactly? Like if you solve- The equilibrium point is not complex. The equilibrium points are all real. These are, these are real system with real variables. All the equilibrium points are real. What we obtained here is that the linearized model for the equilibrium point at the origin the first one has this matrix A, yeah. and the eigenvalues of the matrix A are complex, plus minus J. If you had a different system and you ended up uh, setting the state variable, the derivative of the state variables to zero, and your solution be leads to complex equilibrium points, that means the system the system doesn't have any solution whatsoever. And I think that the homework you have that issue. There was no solution. Yes. Any other question? Yeah, so we will apply this. Now we're going to move into the next subject. Well, the next subject from this was chapter four, which is numerical integration techniques that you review with my PhD student. And you need to be comfortable with the forward Euler techniques and trapezoidal rule. Backward Euler techniques, we will not use that. And the other one is going to be the solver from MATLAB. That's going to be very straightforward how to use it. So most of the time we will use those solvers. Yeah. And now we will move to the next uh, chapter, which is uh, synchronous machine. Um, yeah. Yeah. So for the synchronous machine, again, it, it seems that we always have definition before we get into what is the synchronous machine. And we still have one more definition. And that definition has to do with what we're going to consider as the grid. Uh, I don't know if everyone in power system define this in this fashion, but I prefer to define it in this fashion because we need to make a distinction between what is the grid and the components that we connect to the grid. What are the components we connect to the grid? 
it can be loads, it can be generators, it can be other components, wind energy, energy storage, whatever we need to connect it to the to a point in the system that have a given voltage and a given power, then those are the components we connect to the grid. But what is the grid? The grid is going to be the, the, the system, uh, all the components that can interconnect different points of the system. So for this, we will have transmission lines, and you have AC transmission lines, and then you have HVVC transmission lines, you have transformers, and sometimes for the proper interconnection and proper transfer of power between different points, we will need some components that are needed to improve the interconnection. Sometimes you have series capacitors, sometimes you need to have shunt inductors or shunt capacitors. All of that will be part of the grid and they're needed for a proper interconnection of the components. What is going to be a good grid for us? If you have to say something, what would you say? Uh, one that transmits, uh, well, that transmits energy efficiently. What is transmitted energy efficiently? What is the meaning of that? Uh, with minimal loss. Minimal loss, okay. So we need to minimize the losses in our transmission. What is the efficiency that we will expect? Just a range. 90%. Around 90%, right? Thermal system might be around 30. But electrical system are very high in efficiency. Yeah, that's one point. What else? Okay, efficiency is very good, but what else? Uh, balance between the phases, if you're considering three. Points. Okay, so in this course, very good point. We're going to assume uh, that the system is balanced. So system balance means the power that we demand or generate at each phase is going to be the same. And that has some implication on the signals, voltage and current. That means that the magnitude of the voltage at each phase will be the same. And the angle will be shifted 120 degrees. The same thing for the current. But in this course, we will assume that we're dealing with a balanced system. But what else? What can be a good grid? A uh, good grid, the magnitude of the power generation is equal to the magnitude of the load. So the, the, or the that, that the has to do with the operation and the main goal of the power system, which is balance that. If you have loads in the system, we need to provide that power. And and I guess that that is implied in the question that I am asking, what is a good grid? So if you have generation and consumption that are far apart, and you have this long grid that are interconnecting them, what we're going to expect that if you put power in one point, that power will arrive to whatever the consumption is. Would, would that be always the case? No, sometimes it's not possible. Why is it not possible? There's faults. Be, 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 besides faults, besides fault and failures. Uh, I was actually just about to say uh, that a good component of the grid is uh, having a predictable magnitude and frequency of receiving end voltage. And if that magnitude and frequency is not predictable, then you might not always get the full power that you need. Mm -hmm. So I can summarize this question that I am asking you about what is a good grid by saying what you both are saying, the, 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 the power injected in the system needs to be equal to the power demand, but if you have component far apart, not always that will be feasible because if imagine that you have generation that are far apart from the load and you have a huge uh, power transfer between these two points, what you're going to create, you're going to create voltage drop along the grid, voltage drop. The voltage will be very low at some point. And at some point, if we keep pushing this further, there might be no voltage. And the system might have no equilibrium point, and the system might collapse. So the system can just handle a given amount of power. If we are, we are within those limits, then the system will be able to transfer that power to the receiving end. But also along that way, the voltage, as we load the system, the voltage will start going down and down and down and down. So what is a good grid? It's a grid that is solid, robust, 
that can handle power in the system without a major drop in their voltage or in the buses in the system. That would be a good grid. But any system, any grid will have a limit, right? So if you keep pushing the, the grid, at some point you will start seeing some issues with this voltage. The voltage will go down and at some point you might not even be able to transmit that power to the receiving end. So that's the grid. Lines, transformer, and any other component you need to carry this power from one point to another. Everything else is going to be connected to the grid. So we had been talking about dynamics. We talk about state variables, energy, and linear system, non-linear system, numerical integration techniques. And here we are. What is the grid? And I mentioned this at the introduction. Are we going to have any state variables related to the grid or not? We have lines, and the lines will have an inducted behavior. That inducted behavior will be related with energy storing the magnetic field of the line. But those volumes of energy are limited. Most of the energy we will have will come from the components we connect to the system. And that's going to define the main dynamics in the power system. The dynamics in the grid is going to be minimal, minimal. So we're going to make an assumption here. And the assumption is that the energy is we store in the grid is zero. And because of that, um, if you, if you have the grid, if you have this energy storage, uh, what kind of state variables do you think we might have? Algebraic, if they're uh... What kind of variable? Well, I said the uh, line, and the line will have some inductance, magnetic field around it. And current seems to be a reasonable state variable for that. But that is going to be with an energy that is very small. We will ignore it. What will happen to the current? Energy cannot change discreetly in time. Energy needs to be developed. Now, if we're ignoring that energy, what happens? The current can change instantaneously. If there is a fault, what is the assumption here? The current can change from nothing to full current. It can happen because of our assumption. So for us, the grid, because there is no dynamic behavior involved in the grid, we will assume just a simple steady state representation for the grid. What is that the state representation? The steady state representation. Is what you study in circuit two. What is that? We have a review at the beginning. Balance loads and balance sources. So when you have a system, because these are all AC system, when you have a system, you will have a transient part in a steady state part. The steady state part is going to be what? Sinusoidal with a fixed magnitude for the variables and fixed shift angle for, for the variables, voltage and angle. And because the system is in a steady state, even though it's oscillating, you know, because you have an the oscillating source, um, it doesn't change. It's in a steady state. When that happened, then we use something that is called phasor analysis. And we use phasor to represent the circuit. So we're going to use phasor for the grid. And the meaning why we're using phasor is because we're assuming that the grid will be in a steady state. What about if there is a change, a short circuit, as I said before? Variables will change instantaneously. Instantaneously, those phasor will be changed to a different phasor if magnitudes and angles will show up instantaneously in the variables. Okay? What variables again? Current through the component. What else? Voltages. The most important one are voltages. We call it the nodes in the system, we call it buses. The voltage of the buses can change instantaneously. And we're going to use this phasor representation for the grid. So how do we do this? By using this matrix representation. Do you remember this part, Y bus? So we're going to use this admittance matrix to relate two things, two variables, the current injected 
at the basses nodes in the grid with the voltage at the node in the grid. Because we're connecting components here, what we're going to do here, we're going to relay this current injected to the buses. We're going to relay that to the components that were connected to the grid. For example, here, if this is bus one, what is going to be I1? It's going to be the current that come out of this generator. So this current will be tied to that component that is connected to the grid at that point. What is going to be B1? Well, B1 is going to be the variable from the grid. Is the voltage we will have at this point when you have all this current injection in all the buses in the system. So from one side here, we will have the voltage. These are going to be those variables for the grid that can change instantaneously. Given an injection at the different buses in the system, instantaneously we will have a voltage that will emerge in the different points in the system. Now, briefly, let's review how we obtain the Y bus. So this is a simple example. And in this simple example, we have just two buses. We have a generator here. We have a line and we have a load. What is the grid in this case? Just a line, nothing else. What do we have connected to the grid? A load and a generator. We, we will deal later how we are going to describe this, but now we're centering our attention on the grid. So this is the one line diagram. And this diagram helps us to get the interconnection of the component. But uh, with this one line diagram, we can convert this into the equivalent circuit, which is this one right here. Here we have the voltage at bus one. This is the phase and this is the neutral. This is a per phase equivalent of this system. And this is bus two. This is the point at bus two. This is the phase and this is the neutral. So at bus two, we have the load. At bus one, we have the generator. This is going to be the current injected in the bus, I1. Current injected in bus two is I2, which in this case, is the negative of the current that is being absorbed by this load. If you look at the component here, you have a line and you have a current that goes through that. That's the current through the line, nothing else. So we apply the Kirchhoff equation on this system. And then by Kirchhoff voltage law, you have the voltage at the generator plus the voltage drop in the line plus the voltage at the load these need to be equal, equal to each other. Voltage at the generator is equal to the voltage at the load plus the voltage drop. From here, we can solve for the current through the line because the voltage at the generator is E. This is the same than the voltage at bus one, V1. And then but by Kirchhoff current law, in one node, we have the current injected in bus one is equal to the current that goes through the line. And for the other, the current injected in bus two is the negative that the current that go through the line. So we have the equation, we replace that here, and then we present this in matrix form. As you can see here, we have two equations that will relate the current injected in the buses and the voltage of the bus. So if we write this in matrix form, we obtain this representation, and this term right here is the Y bus. Any question? Second example. Uh, similar system, generator, but now we have two lines. What is the grid here? Uh, the lines still. Line one and line two, right? And that line one and two will interconnect the buses one, two, and three. What are the components connected to the grid? Well, these generator, this load, and this load. We obtain again from the one line diagram the per phase equivalent, which is this one. This is the bus voltage at bus three, phase and neutral, bus two, phase and neutral, bus one, phase and neutral. 
And that is the representation. I haven't said anything about the model yet. The model of this component will define how much are going to be discovered. We need to know those models because that will define that. But when, when you know this current, then we want to determine what is the voltage that will appear at the buses in this system. So what we're going to do here again, fundamental equations, Kirchhoff law. So you will have a KVL, Kirchhoff voltage law here. Another one right here, and Kirchhoff current law here. I want to see what to IL1. I2 is equal to IL2 minus IL1. And here, I3 is negative IL2. So those are the five fundamental equations for this system. And that's what we have. And again, voltage E is voltage at bus B1. We replace that there. And these are the three equations we have for the car. As you can see again, we have a relationship between the injected current and the voltage at the buses in the system. We can uh, present this in matrix form, and this is what we have. And this right here is what we call the Y bus. Yeah? But we can obtain this Y bus in a better way. And we obtain this by inspecting what is happening here for these two cases. So do you remember how we got, get this? You add the, uh, for one bus, you add the uh, inverse of the impedances of, of every, bu of every uh, bus is connected to in the diagonal terms, and then the off-diagonal terms is the negative of each corresponding uh, in inverse of the impedances touching. Yes. Uh, I guess one more. Exactly. And that's what we do. And here we're going to define the admittance component of each, the mean term of each component. So you have the, the impedance for the line, the inverse of the impedance of the line will be the admittance of line one. This is the admittance of line two, the inverse of the impedance. So how we obtain this, and this is the y pass now when you use this term, the uh, admittance term. So what do we observe here, and this is something you can apply in general, that uh, this term, the diagonal term 1, 1, is nothing else than YL1. The term 2, 2 is the sum of these two. And we can take a look at this diagram here. So what you see here that YL1 is the only admittance that is connected to bus one. And that is what we put in the diagonal term, one, one. But for two, two, the, the, the second diagonal term, is the admittance of line one plus admittance of line two. Precisely, these two elements are connected to bus two. And the last diagonal term is just admittance of L2 because it's the only term connected to bus three. So therefore, whenever you determine the diagonal term of this y bus, what you're going to do, you're going to sum the admittance of all components connected to bus y. So no matter how big is the system, we will inspect the system and sum all the admittances to the different buses, and that's going to be the diagonal term. What do we have in the off-diagonal terms? For this one, we have zero because there is nothing connected between bus one and three. But for this one is the negative of YL1, because that's the admittance that you have between bus one and two. So for the off diagonal terms, we will use minus the sum of all admittance of all components connected between buses I and J, okay? So that's the definition for this. And no matter how big is the grid, our model for the grid is going to be through this Y bus that will relate the variables from the grid that can change instantaneously, which are those voltages of the bus with the current injected at the buses. Where that current come from? Well, from the model of whatever component we have connected there. 
So they agreed, you change those current, voltage will change instantaneously. The grid will respond immediately to any change we may have. Okay, we will take it from here on Wednesday. Thank you, Alex. Are these slides up?